Um, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of the Center for Policy Research, it's an absolute privilege for me to welcome all of you to the sixth of our lecture series titled India and the World, commemorating India's 75th independence uh, as part of the Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav. This Mahotsav brings together a wide range of uh, uh, India, uh, of Indian citizens, uh, including uh, academia, uh, research institutions such as ours, to uh, really participate uh, both in remembering uh, our past, uh, remembering and celebrating the progress India has made in these 75 years, and also uh, looking forward to the challenges ahead as India uh, progresses uh, fast and robustly to her centenary celebration as an independent modern nation state. This is a uh, important moment for India, and indeed it is an important moment for all our friends around the world. And so at the Center for Policy Research, we chose to celebrate our 75th by bringing together India's friends from across the globe to reflect, uh, to celebrate, and to help us collectively think forward to the challenges that lie ahead. The lecture series we started uh, is titled India and the World. And over these last six uh, to seven lectures, we've had an absolute privilege uh, to have to, to play host to some of India's greatest friends from around the globe, remembering uh, and celebrating the role that India has played in shaping the global order, uh, thinking through the challenges that we face at home and, uh, and abroad, and collectively articulating uh, a possible road ahead for India um, across, uh, given the very, very significant disruptions that the globe confronts today, disruptions caused by pandemics, by war, by the challenges of global governance and the shifting geopolitical uh, landscape. It is an absolute honor for us today to welcome as our speaker, our distinguished speaker, Minister Praveen Gordhan, who's Minister of Public Enterprises of the Republic of South Africa. India and South Africa have a deep and long history, a shared history, one that we are extremely proud of. Uh, and, we, uh, and, and we have together as nations uh, both uh, reflected, shaped, uh, and engaged. Um, and we look forward, Minister, to your remarks today, uh, both to celebrate our long history and, and, and friendship and to collectively think forward uh, towards what the future lies ahead in this deeply complex uh, geopolitical arena. Thank you so much for gracing us with your presence. It means a lot. I should also add, in addition to a shared history and friendship between us as two countries, you also have a shared history and French friendship with us uh, at the Center for Policy Research. And so we welcome you, not just as a friend of India, but also a friend of our center and hope that this is a continuation of that deep relationship that we have forged with you. Thank you and over to you. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for your very kind uh, uh, welcome. And it's a great privilege and uh, honor uh, to be able to share a few thoughts with yourselves and uh, the other participants. Uh, I want to thank in particular Parta and Pratap and my good friend Fouad Kasim who have been the key agitators behind uh, getting me onto, on, onto the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, so firstly, my greetings, namaskar, vanakam, assalamu alaikum, shalom, and a South African Isizulu greeting, san bonan. Uh, a happy 75th anniversary uh, to the country as a whole. And in many ways, uh, the path of freedom both in India and South Africa have had many common features, let alone common personalities uh, in the form of Gandhi and Mandela and, and the two Congress movements uh, over many, many decades. But after 75 years, it's also time for reflection, as you said, uh, to ask the question, should we reorientate the way in which our societies, economies and the politics uh, is going, and do we have the collective humility to learn from one another 
both about what makes each of our countries, uh, the dynamic countries as they are, particularly India, but also what needs to change and what are the impending risks on the one hand and potential on the other hand. So let me at the outset say that many of the observations I make uh, or offer apply, as I say, both to India and South Africa, and indeed many countries across the globe. This is because we live in a world which has many shared systemic challenges, but also systemic potential, while having our own idiosyncratic trends and challenges in each of our respective countries. Therefore, our solutions must be found both across the globe uh, and within each of the countries that we reside in and remain active in, in one capacity or the other. Of course, South Africa and India, as you have correctly pointed out, uh, have a unique, if not rare, set of historical factors that link them. Colonialism, slavery, a liberation struggle led by legendary political movements, both of which face uh, very different kinds of but similar challenges, and a relationship epitomized by Mahatma Gandhi and Nelson Mandela. And I take this opportunity, uh, even if it's many decades later, for the kind of solidarity that India expressed for South Africa's freedom struggle from the 1940s, both at the United Nations, but also uh, subsequently. And what always enthralled South Africans who visited India and their schools and universities is the passion with which young people were taught about South Africa and uh, the solidarity that they extended uh, to our struggles. I want to also confess at the outset that unlike yourselves, I'm not an academic, but rather a keen student of political economy trends and uh, like many, constantly in search of nuances and paradigms which help to both understand the world, but far more importantly, to change it for the better uh, each time we uh, pass a particular period of time. I therefore speak as, a, as an activist, as a, hopefully a change agent, and a person who has tried to embrace a progressive outlook and passion about social, economic, and political change, which constantly improves the standard of living of the excluded billions across the world. Like many in my country, and I'm sure in yours as well, I am passionate about social justice, a better, deeper democracy, an elite class which cares uh, about the masses apart from themselves, and uh, increasingly, improve the well-being of the many millions that we claim to represent within our democracies. India, China, and many other countries, but not too many, have lifted millions of people out of dire poverty over the past decades and produced a middle class that is skilled with better life prospects and a new set of skills uh, and uh, capabilities. They also play a pioneering role in foreign lands, in commerce, in science, and in technology. Yet in each of our countries, poverty persists, youth unemployment is stubborn, and social services uh, fall uh, way behind what is needed by our, our populations. So I ask a few uh, questions for all of us to address. The first is, of course, what is unique about India within this mix? The second is how does that relate to the world outside and many of the trends that I'm sure we all speak of, but not adequately find solutions to just yet. The third is how do we mobilize uh, amongst Democrats and populations in order to shape a future that is far better than the past, notwithstanding the risks that we face. And of course, in doing so, how do we meet the expectations uh, of our population uh, and of each other in many ways, but also how do we over overcome the kind of questions which I'll come to at the end that confront all of us. So in relation to the uniqueness of India, you are far better placed than I am, but let me highlight a few. Firstly, clearly, uh, it's the kind of anti-colonial struggle 
that still uh, makes you a very proud nation and, and an example uh, and inspiration to many around, across the globe, both in uh, the, the 20th century and beyond as well. Secondly, as I pointed out earlier on, the link between South Africa and India. Third, the fact that you have a vibrant democracy, although at the end we will uh, have to question whether the liberal democracy and its institutions are themselves under threat at this point in time, as we see in many of the Western countries that have driven us towards a liberal democratic order. But amongst the things that uh, India has taught the world is how to be a secular state amongst the multitude of religions, cultures, and languages uh, that you share amongst the population. How do you manage religious diversity, notwithstanding uh, some of the more recent challenges that you have, but others uh, across the world have as, as well? You've made phenomenal progress, uh, economically speaking. And I believe that depending on the measure that you use, and you are again better placed than I am, uh, you are soon to be the fourth or third largest uh, economy in, in the globe. Uh, but at the same time, it's interesting to go back, as one author did, to the 1600s when Indian GDP was about 22% of the global GDP. In 1870, it was 12%, and today it's 3%. And yet there's huge potential, I'm sure you will accept, uh, for that to become a very different set of proportions as we go forward. Like many have said, you have the demographic dividend on your side and uh, the size of your population and potentially the size of the market that you actually have. You will soon be amongst the leading exporters of services and commodities in one form or another. Your achievements in relation to digitalization, your Aadhaar card and so on are uh, examples of what political will and technological capability can achieve, uh, which many other countries, including our own, should be able to emulate. At important stages in your history, uh, people like Manmohan Singh in the early 1990s have demonstrated economic leadership and boldness, which have taken you as a country out of uh, a 1% so-called Hindu growth rate, uh, rate to a very different uh, situation right now, which is around 7%. But unique in your case is your diaspora, uh, which you very proudly um, acknowledge and which plays a remarkable role to the extent we understand it in relation to the kind of contribution both uh, economically that is made and in terms of transfers uh, but uh, the impact that that diaspora makes uh, in the economies, particularly in the developed world. But there are many complexities, as, as all of us know, uh, that the so-called outside world uh, will impose upon India and all of us as well. And it appears that more and more we are moving into greater states of complexity, uh, more complex geopolitics and geoeconomics. Uh, some of which can be traced as Raghuram Rajan does to the 2008 crisis and the kind of economic distress that was created by the financial crisis in the West. And which has led in his view to both the economic distress on the one hand, but also a distrust of the political classes and institutions in our societies. So in that sense, there's a kind of democratic deficit uh, that all of us have to be mindful of as we chart the way forward uh, for the next few decades. A crucial element uh, that I'm sure all of us are talking about is how democracy and populism, particularly the wrong kind of populism, are interacting with each other and weakening uh, the kind of democratic foundations that each of our nations have created. Some, like our own, is a very young democracy, and others, like yours, somewhere in the middle range, 
and yet others who, who go back centuries, or so they claim. And in each of them, we've had examples in the last two or three years alone of the kind of uh, undermining of the democratic ethos and the challenging of democratic institutions as well. Clearly, one of the uh, outcomes of the crisis that Rajan and others talk about is the emergence of a set of elites in every society, particularly uh, amongst our own, which stands in contradistinction to the interests of the masses. So it's one of the great paradoxes of our time that at, at a time during the COVID pandemic, when most of the world was shut down uh, or in lockdown in one form or another, you had uh, elites multiplying their uh, wealth uh, on a phenomenal scale, whilst uh, ordinary folk, particularly the uh, frontline workers, had great difficulty uh, in coping with life, and the impact of that can still be seen today. So those are, uh, I think, uh, some of the choices. But geopolitically, we are also, both in South Africa and India, um, asked to make some choices in inverted commas. Are you pro-West? Are you pro-East? Are you pro-G77? Or are you actually a country that is able to take, uh, let's call it an independent line on some of the geopolitical phenomena that are playing themselves out in Europe and elsewhere in the world? The other tragedy, particularly from an African point of view, and by that I mean a continental point of view, our continent, and I'm sure there are parts of Asia as well, has uh, become the playground of uh, many different uh, interest groups, West, East, and the new moneyed powers uh, that have natural resources that give them huge financial capabilities, uh, as we just saw. Now, I'm not sure how many of you uh, are fans of soccer in a, in a country that's obsessed with cricket, <laughs> but uh, uh, the recent events in Qatar, I think, uh, have some fascinating uh, lessons for all of us. So it's against this background uh, that we, we have to ask ourselves a, a set of questions and, and uh, raise a set of issues, which are in fact asking us, uh, as um, Adam too says, to recognize that we are living in a polycrisis world. And uh, the question is, how do we manage and navigate uh, both democratic uh, uh, issues on the one hand, but economic issues and well-being as well uh, in this state of polycrisis or what others have begun to call permacrisis? And these are uh, issues that follow uh, from that kind of assessment. Firstly, the recognition that we are at a historical inflection point and that the pop forces of populism from the so-called extreme left, but certainly the extreme right, are competing for ascendancy uh, against uh, the so-called liberal democratic order that our constitutions represent. And by the way, South Africa has learned a lot uh, in our formative period in the early 1990s. And we visited your country in the crafting of our constitution to learn what not to do, but also learn what to do uh, in a quasi-federal situation uh, as you find yourselves in and we find ourselves in as well. Secondly, the issue of the financial crisis of 2008, which we thought was a short-term uh, event, has in the view of some metastasized into an economic, social, and political crisis. The rise of nationalism in the recent past I think poses also great risks to the democratic foundations uh, that our nations have been built on. And uh, in some ways, populism is a symptom of, that, of this period, but itself may exacerbate economic problems and not really solve them. Or as one author in the New Left Review pointed out, that we, are, we seem to be um, in a period where leaders are able to legitimize 
uh, their actions through a mixture of limited welfare measures for the poor in a majoritarian nationalism that sustains itself by stifling the democratic process. So the question which I will return to is what some have called the democratic coup. And uh, we certainly see that happening uh, in our own country where there are various attempts uh, to, if you like, divert us from the kind of vision that the Mandela's and so on had for our country uh, and create a very different kind of situation in which a new elite emerges uh, that makes every effort to use the levers of political power and state power in order to uh, fill their own pockets, to put it in very simple terms. Furthermore, part of this body crisis is the retreat from multilateralism, uh, which can also create uh, the basis for the next crisis. Now, again, both India and South Africa played a, a fascinating role uh, in the WTO over the last two years or so in trying to ensure that intellectual property rights, uh, in particularly uh, uh, in relation to the vaccines that were largely developed in the West and in which India played a very important role in manufacturing, were made accessible to all of humanity because those in some ways became public goods and global public goods as, as, as well. So I think that kind of partnership uh, is, is one that is necessary as, as we look into the future and the kind of challenges that we have. But the failure of multilateralism, the failure of global governance through institutions like the G20 um, as has been happening over the last four or five years uh, are danger signs that uh, the world is not always willing to collaborate uh, on a multilateral basis when confronted uh, with issues uh, when it could actually demonstrate during the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, uh, that extraordinary measures can in fact be taken uh, if there is the political and economic world to actually do so. So economies need to be more productive, not destructive. And the key that I think each of our societies is, is looking forward to is inclusive growth. And uh, that is something that is evading us at the moment. Certainly in a country like South Africa, where the history of apartheid was the history of exclusion, both politically and economically, um, inclusive growth is, is a vital issue that we have not adequately broken through uh, and made uh, meaningful advances in, except for a very narrow group of people. But today, across the globe, inclusivity and the benefits, uh, massification, if you like, of benefits uh, for all of society arising from growth is a challenge that uh, I hope institutions like your own will apply its, uh, its uh, immense resources to, to give us uh, some answers in that particular regard. So in sum, the future is complex and challenging. Um, the fourth industrial revolution, which India has coped with uh, remarkably well uh, so far and shown a great deal of agility. FinTech, the new growth opportunities and the di digital age, which again, you have demonstrated uh, great propensity at uh, all important new trends that we have to apply uh, our, our minds to. And uh, it is in this kind of context that we have to ask questions about how do we ensure that uh, the, um, sorry about that. Uh, how do we ensure that democracies are able to actually uh, service all of society as opposed to just some in society itself. So in, in, in that context, uh, colleagues, uh, let, let me then move to uh, the question, how do you mobilize, uh, firstly, using our own uh, idiosyncratic strengths and uh, capabilities whilst recognizing our weaknesses, 
Um, secondly, how do we uh, countenance the new uh, trends like de deglobalization, lack of inclusive growth, as I pointed out, and lack of benefits being passed to all sections of the population, um, and, and ensure that uh, we overcome the worst uh, in both uh, humanity's uh, political nature, but in human nature as well, in, in order to uh, overcome some of the challenges that we are actually uh, talking about. So it, it's uh, the question of mobilizing for the future and who takes the responsibility and how do we combine our resources in that particular direction uh, is, is a challenge that I think uh, we need to then apply our, our, our minds to at, at the end of the day. So the questions that arise, uh, firstly, as I begin to head towards some kind of conclusion, is given uh, the, the immense strengths that India has demonstrated over many decades, and uh, the recognition also that there are people like yourselves and others who are willing to and able to reflect on the kind of weaknesses that uh, that, that each of our countries is, is, is demonstrating from time to time, how do we uh, galvanize for a different future, but certainly a better future and, and, a, and a transformed future? So it's in that context that we have to ask the question, and I'll leave that to you uh, as part of our debate, the first of which is, how do we create a genuine progressive democracy? meaning that dem democratic institutions are not captured by elites in favor of the elites themselves, but to the exclusion of uh, the majority of the population. And uh, the longer that exclusion continues, and I quote here Mohammed El Erian that many of you are familiar with, when he says, the longer the economic malaise endures the greater the influence of anger politics and i think we've seen examples of how anger politics can take us in the wrong kind of, of direction similarly uh, martin wolf of the of the financial times uh, argues eloquently and i quote to maintain legitimacy economic policy must seek to promote the interests of the many and not the few and the same theme again how, how do we transform from a highly divided uh, world and society to one that is far more orientated towards social justice and towards uh, the advancement of the standard of living of everyone uh, concerned. Uh, Danny Roderick, that all of you would also be very familiar with, also puts uh, the same problem in a slightly different way when he argues that democracy, national sovereignty, and Global economic integration are mutually incompatible. We can combine any two of the three, but never have all three simultaneous, uh, simultaneously and in full. So in other words, how do we act in, in a global context um, and keeping in mind global interests, but at the same time maintain national sovereignty and don't allow it to be uh, diluted in any kind of way by various factors uh, that impinge upon us in a geopolitical or geoeconomic sense. A set of questions that then arise uh, in a genuine progressive democracy will be firstly, as I said, inclusivity. Secondly, inclusive institutions. Thirdly, the uh, checks on public and corporate power, far more effective than what we've had to date. And then third, uh, fourthly, the question of a servant state and a servant leadership. Often this is spoken about, but very difficult to achieve uh, in, in many of our, of our own situations. And a question that's very much alive in South Africa, but in other parts of the world as well, is what kind of checks and balances do you put in place, uh, either institutionally or in terms of the kind of narratives that we have within our societies uh, that will ensure that governments and uh, corporates are kept honest, so to speak. And in that sense, 
uh, India is well endowed with active civil society organizations, including research institutions like your own. And increasingly, we see both here in South Africa and elsewhere, similar challenges uh, being uh, taken on uh, by people who don't want to join a political party, but want to, in fact, ensure that they have some leverage over what political office bearers uh, do. But democracy at the end of the day it is dependent and its uh, well-being is dependent upon an informed public. And this is the, the, the big challenge that we have, that where media is in the hands of pri private, hand, uh, private ownership and private owners who have their own agendas and become the main source of information stroke education about the state of affairs in the world, how do we actually ensure that the public is informed better than they actually are, that they're not driven by populist politics and, and, and rhetoric, as we see in South Africa, but you'll see in your own context as well, and uh, uh, ensure that when making choices in elections or outside of elections, the public has enough information that will enable it to actually do so. An important uh, mission, if you like, that all of our societies uh, search for and uh, aim towards is to find that collective of incorruptible institutional leaders. Um, and, and that, again, is, is a crucial task that we have in any democracy that's actually going to survive. Because uh, if we can't find leaders and uh, political and other institutions that uh, meet the standards of uh, delivering better and better social justice to the vast majority of people, then democracy itself is, is a failure and is left to the whims, fancies, and self-interest of uh, those who want to take it in a different kind of, of direction. So it's in that context that the concept of a democratic coup uh, sounds like a paradox, but uh, it is one that I think is uh, occupying many thinkers across the globe. At first, it was about destroying democratic institutions so that you could uh, access uh, public resources. But now it's about taking over democratic institutions through what appear to be electoral processes uh, by creating narratives that appear to serve the majority uh, but at the same time, uh, the intent is to ensure that kleptocrats and populists uh, and sometimes even dynasties, uh, which we've seen here in South Africa as well, uh, take over these institutions in order to advance their, their own uh, interests at the end of the day. So being an activist, I, I suppose I, I put forward a challenge for all of us um, that if uh, the globe is moving in a troublesome polycrisis direction. If each of our countries has many strengths that we can actually build on, and if we can produce the right kind of institutions and, and leaders, what would it take to create a coherent movement of uh, uh, Democrats that uh, will ensure that there is progress in the right kind of direction, that there is, in fact, as I said earlier, an informed public, and that there's a change in political culture, which uh, enables our people to become a lot more discriminatory about what they accept as the truth and, and uh, what they accept as being in their own uh, interest, as opposed to the interests of narrow elites uh, and, and uh, political players in each of our own situations. So uh, in, in our kind of situation, uh, as activists, you've got to be an optimist. Otherwise, you, you give up very quickly. And uh, I think our collective optimism comes from, firstly, ensuring that we have developed the right kind of paradigm uh, and tools that enables us to actually understand where is the globe going currently and where is it likely to end up and will it meet the standards of social justice that so many have fought for over so many 
centuries actually, and humanity has certainly advanced in that sense, but not advanced adequately up to, up to this point in time. Secondly, what are the kinds of institutions we need to establish outside those that the liberal democratic order demands of us, which will ensure that uh, policy capture or state capture, as we've been calling it in South Africa, doesn't uh, become the norm of the day, but in, instead the state is a servant state. A state is there to serve all, uh, even contradictory uh, interest groups uh, in order that that particular society uh, advances itself. And then lastly, how do we mobilize like-minded people uh, and leaders across the globe so that uh, we can actually ensure uh, that there is a global dynamic. Uh, and I hope that the lectures that you have been arranging can create a basis for that. But there's a global dynamic uh, that brings together like-minded people as they have around issues like climate change, for example, uh, and to shift the world on a, onto a, a different trajectory. And uh, in humility, we will have to say we don't have all the answers, but uh, the search for the answers must continue uh, with a great deal of honesty and self-reflection and humility as well. Uh, but at the same time, we need to train generation after generation of younger people who don't want to become politicians. I see you called me a politician. I'm actually a political activist. I refuse to be called a politician. Uh, but you need, you need young people who are driven by the idealism that both gave democracy both to India, but also to South Africa as, as, as well. And that idealism, I think, can take us uh, into a different kind of global and country direction. And let's hope, uh, not, and not only hope, but work towards that kind of objective. Once again, thank you very much for the great privilege of sharing some of these thoughts. I hope I have not uh, shaken anybody too much uh, in, in doing so. Um, but any exchange like this, I think, requires us to be frank about ourselves. And uh, we can certainly begin to find new answers as we begin to understand the situation better. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was an, uh, uh, your words resonate so much with so many of our observations, anxieties, um, and uh, a search for sites of hope uh, as we uh, respond to the many challenges uh, that the world confronts. I think there is so much uh, of what we assumed uh, we knew um, and so much about the pathways of where liberal democracy was going to take us that across the globe today um, are really up to, uh, in contestation. Uh, the poly crisis sort of frames this challenge uh, so effectively. Um, and and uh, many of the questions you raise and, and your point that we need to collectively uh, uh, come together to ask these difficult questions uh, as we look for answers um, is uh, speaks so much to the conversations we've been having uh, both at CPR as well as more broadly in the public sphere in India and crucially through uh, the platform of this lecture series, India in the World. Um, I know we have a little bit of time for questions. Uh, so uh, may I request all the audience to please post their questions in the Q&A box and I'll try and pull some of this together. But let me start, uh, Minister, if I may, uh, with pushing uh, the envelope a little bit on how we think about um, moving towards a renewed paradigm. I was a few months ago uh, involved in a conversation with a South African uh, a research institution on the architecture of governance. Um, and we spoke a lot about, uh, th there, were, uh, there were others from different parts of the world as well, speaking about the role of uh, federalism and more importantly, deeper local government ca governance can play uh, in addressing some of the challenges of democracy becoming a, a more representational site of a multiplicity of voices, uh, a multiplicity of stakeholders. And within that, of course, the challenge of how do you ensure that 
these local sites of democracy, local government institutions also don't fall themselves into the, 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 the very challenge of elite capture. And I was curious to hear your views uh, on this. Does do, does uh, a deeper federalism, uh, more effective local governance in some ways uh, possibly hold some of the institutional answers to the challenge of uh, addressing our democratic anxieties? Wow, that's a, a, a difficult one. <laughs> <laughs> and again, it's, it's, uh, the answer to that is dependent upon the kind of history that a particular country comes out of. So remember that in the South African context, for many uh, decades or centuries, on the one hand, you had British colonialism uh, governing us, and uh, they created an environment post-1860 when gold and diamonds were in inverted commas discovered, uh, where reserves were for the uh, older people and the younger people and the working males uh, were part of a migrant labor system that went to the mines and, and operated the mines, including from neighboring countries. Then you had from about 1950, the formalization of that uh, by the apartheid uh, uh, political parties into what you might remember as Bantustans. And they tended to be ethnically orientated so there was a Bantustan for a Zulu speaking uh, group of people, which is the largest language group in South Africa. But equally, um, by the time we got to 1960, uh, both for the smaller uh, Indian population, but colored population as well, they created uh, separate nominated chambers um, that they decided, you know, they like uh, Parta's beard, so he shall be a member of uh, that particular house. And so when, when negotiations started, firstly in 1988, when the ANC began to craft its constitutional principles, and then when properly from nine, late 1991, 1992, uh, and, and more so 1993, we got to that stage, you had political parties that wanted almost a, a kind of confederalism. Uh, so you were almost a Swiss style uh, national body, but you did your own thing, so to speak, within that environment. So the word federalism in South Africa, after a long story, uh, has a particular set of connotations, which means fragmentation. Mm. Um, so, and, and in a sense, we crafted a constitution that uh, had both what we call a unitary component, but also a federal component. And like India Very much uh, right. and, and, and other countries, we had concurrent powers uh, for certain areas like health, education, etc. Some of which we regret today, by the way. <laughs> and uh, But at the same time, I understand uh, the second part of your question far more importantly, is local democracy, local voices, uh, the local capability to hold uh, political office bearers and bureaucrats to account uh, far more effectively than we do at the moment. The, the question is still the one that I hinted at earlier on, uh, how do you convert that local voice and energy into action? How do you convert that into a driving force for transformation of the democratic ethos uh, at, at, at a local level. And uh, that's where the change agents come in. That's where greater information comes in. But also that's where, as I'm sure you came across in your conversation, uh, the empowerment of people mm. and, and confidence of people to say, if you don't want to fix this road or you don't want to fix that leaking tap, we as a community are going to do it. And uh, later on, we'll sort you out when the next election comes uh, in, in terms of returning you or not returning you to office. So I think at, at that level, uh, federalism in our context is, is a, a, a dubious uh, proposition, particularly like India, 
when it is related to ethnicity of any kind, uh, because you can't separate the two. But uh, local democracies, I think, play a very important part. I think there's been over uh, the decades uh, so uh, a lot of exchange of ideas uh, amongst uh, uh, among civil society, academia as well, on precisely some of these questions. Uh, I myself have been involved in some conversations on right to information, freedom of information, on civic participation, as we struggle uh, as democracies uh, to identify more effective pathways for precisely what you say, for the democratic ethos uh, to be more deeply embedded and for voices to find more effective ways uh, of holding states to account, which sort of brings me in a way uh, to uh, a question that several colleagues who've uh, posed questions on our, uh, on our Q&A and web chat as well are asking, which um, has a little bit, has a lot to do with um, our uh, role as nations uh, exchanging ideas and building an alternative vision. Um, yeah, some decades ago, uh, uh, BRICS, I mean, India, Brazil, South Africa, IPSA was, uh, you know, a, an important framing. Um, in fact, if I recall right, several colleagues at CPR2 were part of academic exchanges uh, between our countries uh, on uh, the evolution of middle class, uh, debating ideas of development and economic growth. Um, but in some ways, these haven't... Um, would it be, uh, a, you know, I, we're curious to hear your response to the effectiveness of these uh, configurations, alliances, and what are ways in which these can be strengthened uh, or reconfigurated uh, such that, uh, you know, you also spoke about challenges of global inequality and global governance, such that, you know, these can become a collective voice. This is a live conversation in India, especially against the backdrop of the G20, uh, where uh, there is some uh, uh, articulation of the global South more broadly uh, as a voice that needs to be heard more effectively in, in, in global governance. Uh, so curious to hear your response, both to the very specific, you know, India, Brazil, South Africa as space as alliances that could have come together? Did we lose that opportunity? Uh, but moving forward, what are the formations that you think could um, come together to give more voice to this larger framing of Global South that, that India is beginning to try and articulate? That's an excellent question. And uh, yeah, I, I think in the case of BRICS uh, stroke IPSA, uh, the first achievement was the creation of the institution itself. Second, it was the uh, question of getting key leaders uh, around the table and in the statements that they issued, having some common purpose articulated. The third is there were, and so are, a number of, of, of there's almost a proliferation of uh, uh, collaborative exchanges, dialogue, exchange of information, whether it's science or labor or other societal issues. So those are all important advances. Um, I think in the, in the G20, well, let me finish this point. The missing uh, part, in my view, is converting voice into action, converting voice into leverage. Mm. Um, and so the so geopolitically, the question that needs to be asked is what does that collective bring uh, as far as leverage is concerned? And now we all know that uh, the financial markets are dominated by the so-called West, that through ratings agencies, they determine our lives, that institutions until recently, like the World Bank and IMF, had a particular orientation. It's changing. Uh, particularly since Christine Lagarde's uh, period at, at the IMF. Um, but as we've learned uh, more recently, both on the climate change issue, but also on the COVID challenges, the IMF was not able to adequately come to the party. Either So there was the first distribution of SDRs, um, but there was still space to do more. Uh, and the next challenge is going to be in, in relation to um, 
making sure that uh, the debt that uh, developing country, some, somebody has muted me, I think. We can hear you. Oh, you we can. can. Uh, resolving uh, the debt that the developing countries have accumulated uh, over this period is going to be the next challenge as we as we go forward. So converting uh, a similar mindset, but remember that as we went into the last, what, five to eight years, the political composition of BRICS changed as well in terms of orientation. And uh, that can't be ignored. I'm being very polite about what I'm saying, but I think uh, you, know, <laughs> you know what I'm suggesting. Um, similarly in the G20, um what, we, what my experience uh, direct experience has been that at the best of times the bigger developing countries tend to uh, get into arrangements that suit their national purpose as opposed to making sure that the collective intent remains in place in contradistinction to that the more recent uh, discussions at cop 27 uh, demonstrated that the G77 could stick together. It could make a, collect, a very similar set of demands in terms of financing the just energy transition. And those are important factors. Um, so it, it seems an issue by issue based uh, approach on, on each of those uh, questions. But I suppose the more analytical question that I'm sure you are posing is, um, how do you develop leverage? How do you make sure that you can, in fact, uh, defy the center of gravity, so to speak? Which is happening in some ways around, for example, uh, the transactions around oil and so on that India is engaged with. And uh, where you have an institution or country like yours that is too big to ignore, inverted commas, um then you have interesting leverage uh, and and how is that leverage used for the benefit of developing countries as a whole uh, particularly when the macroeconomic effects of uh, some of these developments in europe are quite uh, devastating in terms of inflation interest rates etc um, is i think a question that needs to be asked Apologies, we'd muted ourselves. It took a second to unmute. Um, just as a follow-up, thank you, Minister. Uh, just as a follow-up to that, I think uh, there are two uh, sort of related threads. Um, one that's sort of asking you uh, to reflect a little bit uh, on uh, how the West has responded to uh, both the democratic anxieties, uh, challenges, as well as uh, the larger uh, geopolitical challenges. Um, do you, would it be fair to argue that the West is falling back on sort of racial affinities of Anglo-Saxon or uh, 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 networks, uh, coalitions, uh, Europe's response in the context of Ukraine? Um, and sort of in relation to that, uh, is it is there a space to articulate um, or engage with the idea of new solidarities uh, that we can collectively seek? Uh, in the context of the global south, the global east, um, uh, you know, or sort of actively, effectively articulate these rather than leveraging ourselves within Western alliances. So just curious uh, to hear your response to that. Yeah, I, I didn't make one comment that I should have made uh, in concluding my comments on the G20, and that is compare the cohesiveness of the G7 when they decide to act on something versus uh, the G20 or BRICS. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so I think that tells a story of its own. Uh, secondly, I don't think you're entirely wrong about the Anglo-Saxon uh, axis, so to speak, uh, which then ex extends way beyond ethnicity uh, to military alliances, to intelligence sharing, 
uh, and collective actions when it suits their particular collective or national interests at, at, at the end of the day. Uh, is there space for new solidarities? Yes, but it's going to require a new generation of enlightened leadership um, that, that is able to both uh, uh, keep a leg, so to speak, in a national context on the one hand, but also keep a, a, a foot in the door of international solidarity as well. And uh, that's going to require a special kind of leadership, I think, uh, at this point in time. Thank you. Uh, Partho had uh, a question, so I'm going to give him the last question before we wrap up. Over to you, to, uh, Put that stuff in place. Uh, thank you so much, Minister. There's so much um, food for thought in this. Um, I'm going to sort of ask you to reflect, uh, if you would, on uh, two interrelated issues. One is related to this notion of leadership. And as uh, young and younger sort of democracies, are we sort of too fixated on the personality of the leader? And is it the case that the more G7s of the world, so to speak, um, have sort of transcended that and they have the populations have come to a determination that we will not find that inspiring leader. And therefore they have resigned themselves or rather uh, moved along to um, depend much more on institutions and on local action, as you say, uh, to solve their problems. And more importantly, uh, on very rich networks of engagement across academic, political, and civil society uh, in these countries. And um, it's a feature that we don't see as much between uh, you know, the G20, the IBSA, the BRICS, whichever we see it. I mean, and I'm especially reminded of uh, this wonderful work that South Africa did uh, uh, during the uh, COVID pandemic uh, on um, uh, research uh, and genomes and variants and uh, the sort of still relatively limited engagement that we have had with large populations of such researchers in India, Brazil, etc. So uh, is it that somehow the G7s and countries like that have sort of transcended the dependence on individual leadership and moved and therefore have invested more in institutions and is somehow our uh, fascination with our leadership uh, because we have wonderful examples who have led us to uh, independence in living memory uh, sort of inhibited us from exerting as much effort on institutions and on building these rich, deep networks across our nations that actually allow for these new axes of collaborations to emerge. Yo, yes, we're gonna need an hour for that. And, <laughs> uh, no, I think it's a very important question, but there's, uh, I'm not sure if you will agree, but, uh, there's a fascinating dialectic between the individual and the institution. So you, you can actually build up uh, an institution for 20 years. And there comes along an individual who can, uh, for all sorts of reasons, uh, just mess up the institution. So it took us 10 years in South Africa. Uh, including collaboration with your tax and customs people and others elsewhere in the world to build a truly world-class class tax and customs administration. You're familiar with our experience because it has uh, some Indian origins as well uh, with state capture. 
And you just put in one individual, and there was a handful around him, and within six months, he destroyed 10, 10 years of work, which means now you're going to spend another five years uh, recapturing, re-establishing uh, the culture, the norms, the ethics, the integrity, let alone the systems uh, that, that you had. Similar things happened with the National Prosecuting Authority. Similar experiences are now being had, certainly in my portfolio, around the energy uh, and electricity entities and lo logistics entities as, as well. So provided institutions themselves actually have a bit of muscle of their own, so to speak, where if you step out of the norm, there's a way of calling you to account, so to speak. Um, either in, in the context of a strong parliamentary democracy uh, or uh, civil servants and public servants who actually say, I refuse to do what you're asking me to do because it's against the law and have the courage uh, to be able to do so. so. But then you come back to the individual uh, in, in, in a sense. So G7, G8 was a and remains a powerful institution. But what it does on a particular uh, challenge uh, depends to a large extent on who occupies the seat uh, in the White House. You, you've seen both varieties in the last five years. So it, it's that interplay, I think, that uh, is, is quite crucial. And, and what's important is um, to ensure that uh, you, you actually have the right kind of uh, social milieu within which those institutions operate as well, where you, you are uh, not a, a allowing uh, the most retrogressive elements to become the dominant elements in, 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 in those institutions. If you take the instance of the experience with COVID, there's the research part. And, and I mean, it was marvelous to watch. The South Africans will discover uh, coronavirus uh, Delta. The British will say it was, it was found in uh, South Africa, but it was in their backyard long before it was found in South Africa. And, and uh, you had some fascinating narratives developed around that. So you, you, know, you, you guys are the problem, so to speak. What our president was able to do, for example, uh, is argue both as chair of the African Union, but also in, in the South African capacity to uh, actually say that the COVID vaccine must be shared across the African continent, must be shared with developing countries, but nobody would listen. Canada, I think, had three, four times the stocks it would actually require to service its entire population, and so on, and so on, and so on. At the same time, uh, your government uh, was highly uh, collaborative and helpful in, in the, the earlier versions of the vaccine being, being shared. And, and what that leaves us with but, uh, is, is an important question. We've got to redefine what are global public goods? Mm. And, 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 and then ask the question, what's, what's the global policy that would best suit the majority of the world population? Um, so yes, we accept water is a global public good, education is a global public good, and so on. But there are new varieties that are on the horizon now, arising from... Uh, new new dynamics that are unfolding and uh, we, we, we're not moving with the times. So if you go back to the question of the solidarity, Eastern solidarity or East-South solidarity, part of that is not to keep repeating the old narratives. Part of that is also raising the bar, as one would say, and creating new frontiers. Um, and my last point there would be that when and this cuts across some of the questions uh, together, is if issues like vaccines and so on are tied to commercial interests, then uh, it's the commercial interest that dominates at the, at the end of the day. 
So how, how do you, within a neoliberal uh, economic frame, actually ensure that the commercial interest also becomes a global interest uh, and that there's a space created to make your profit on the one hand, but at the same time ensure that uh, the uh, global population is served and serviced uh, in, in, in the right kind of way. Thank you. That's solving that conundrum will also help us solve the global warming to a large extent. But indeed, Minister, I think in your remarks you've, uh, in some ways, uh, laid out uh, the agenda for uh, uh, a reimagined global governance uh, framework, and I think that both India and South Africa have a really significant role to play. Uh, and perhaps this ought to be the basis for uh, a, a more robust uh, alignment uh, between our nations. Um, it certainly uh, also uh, is a reminder that both as, as young and younger democracies, uh, we are collectively uh, struggling with similar anxieties and probably have uh, a fairly significant possibility of working together and sharing our experiences to learn how to respond to these anxieties. Uh, there is the one thing that gives me hope in the in 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 these moments of uh, of sort of democracy's uh, last sigh is that there there still remain uh, sites of a mobilization of deep civic action and great experimentation in both our countries from our history and in our present, that if I think we can collectively come together to share these uh, and, and engage these and really bring them to the global platform, they hold within it lessons, uh, not just for our countries, uh, but for the globe on how to redeem the power and possibility of the, of the promise of liberal democracy uh, that so many of our uh, great leaders in our history uh, as individual nations fought for, uh, for us to arrive at this moment. I think uh, your talk is uh, both a reflective and a reminder of uh, the fact that we need to go, we, we need, we need to uh, collectively come to terms with where we are today uh, in our historical and democratic trajectories, but also a very good reminder that there is an agenda ahead that we can build together and a lot of work for us to do and the possibilities uh, that, that, that we confront uh, together may help us shape a better world. So thank you so much for this. It really has been uh, a, an extreme privilege for us and such an opportunity. And I hope that we can take some of these ideas forward together uh, because together there probably is a lot of power in this. Thank you. Now, thank you from my side as well, and thank you for being brave enough to invite an activist to your forum and <laughs> And uh, yeah, our, our task collectively, I think, is to create hope, uh, to take on some of the dangerous things that are happening in the world, um, and uh, make sure that we all contribute to the kind of social justice we want to see. Uh, so I certainly look forward to further interactions with you and to the guests that joined us uh, at this late hour thank you very much uh, for your interest thank you thank you very much really thank you bye-bye good night good night